Hello, I come to you from the USGS National Earthquake Information Center in Golden, Colorado. And what I'll cover today is the important notion that the products that we produce for real-time earthquake information, the shaking hazard and impact, actually are the key ingredients that can be used in a probabilistic realm for looking at risk and uh, risk reduction. So I'll take you through some of the real-time products and show you how they're related to our long-term risk mitigation. This is what I call our USGS earthquake information system. On the left are the pre-earthquake mitigation tools, for instance, probabilistic seismic hazard assessment. From the seismic hazard assessment, we have the underlying faults that we can use for earthquake scenarios, for planning exercises, and for emergency response uh, planning. And then we go into the earthquake mode within the earthquake time where we produce the initial information and then these subsequent products that are in the loss uh, and other hazard uh, generations. So we're looking at years before the earthquake in terms of mitigation, the time of the earthquake, and then tens of minutes after the earthquake for post-earthquake response and recovery. There's a lot of dependencies here, so doing this in-house gives us the long-term tools that we need to do loss calculations from the hazards that we produce. But when you look at that in a com and combine that with a probabilistic sense, you then get a risk uh, in a, that's useful for pre-earthquake mitigation, particularly for building codes and for uh, insurance products and long-term uh, risk mitigation. It's kind of important that we have this combination of a real-time effort and the long-term risk mitigation. We can look at the um, what we collect from a data resource in terms of background seismicity and fault models, and ultimately get out of that the um, probabilistic seismic hazard map, which is used for long-term risk mitigation. So an example of a recent earthquake, the Turkish earthquake uh, in magnitude 7.8. Here's the event page, the earthquake event page, where all these products show up in near real time. And we can look back at the Did You Feel It map, which shows the intensity of shaking, shake map uh, it takes the intensities, as well as seismic stations, and knowledge of fault planes, uh, and site conditions to make the best estimate of shaking, which goes into our pager system. That estimates uh, the fatality estimates on certain uh, estimates of fatalities and economic losses. And now we're producing a new product called ground failure, which shows the probability of landsliding, in this case, or liquefaction. And actually, we just recently got back uh, some information about landslides within the mountainous communities that are, look quite severe. Uh, but of course, the focus for the response right now is on the buildings that are collapsed in the urban areas and in the rural towns that uh, have been devastated. The uh, domestic earthquake front, uh, we produce the same suite of products. We have a, another product called ShakeCast. ShakeCast is a tool that we use for specific organizations, like in this case, California Par Department of Transportation, who uses it to determine the priority of inspection of bridges after a major earthquake. And that can be used for other organizations and other companies for looking at their own facilities. One of the keys of our uh, communication tools and what we ultimately communicate into hazard and risk is our connection of the severity of shaking of the ground in terms of intensity based on historical means. That's the description of what people experienced and the likely and, and the um, damage they, they witnessed to the ground motions that we record in terms of acceleration of the ground. So we can take historical events and assign intensities and we can take modern events and look at the acceleration of the ground and any combination of these to produce good uh, shake maps for historical earthquakes. Now, the underlying um, expertise in the USGS, of course, is on the hazard evaluation. This is the USERF 3 hazard map. This is the fault rupture forecast for California. And for all of these faults, we have the likelihood or the probability of them rupturing over a certain amount of time, which then feeds into our national seismic hazard map. Again, here, we're going to communicate this hazard map not only through the engineering parameters of spectral acceleration needed for design of structures uh, and the long-term risk analysis there, but also in terms of intensity so that we can communicate this more generally to the wider audience. Here we have the probability of shaking over intensity six, which is where damage begins, and we've over overlain that on a population map to try to get an assessment of the kind of first order hazard uh, based on population and shaking potential. That, of course, can be fed into uh, HAZIS, which is the FEMA's tool for looking at lost impacts domestically. And we've developed FEMA 366, which is a long-term risk map in terms of annualized losses. And this, again, is 
very important for building codes for prioritizing what areas get attention in terms of mitigation and also for insurance purposes. Uh, and this is currently being updated uh, by the USGS and FEMA with modern or with the most recent uh, inventory and the most recent population demographics. The other thing we can do with these probabilistic maps is to take out the individual faults that go into those and make scenarios. And these scenarios are extremely popular for exercises and for planning drills. And so we've been able to do that and generate losses for each of these earthquakes and provide that for planning purposes. And these have gotten to be so popular for mitigation and risk analysis that we've developed over 800 of these scenarios and put those uh, in, a, in an archive for people to pull out and look at the uh, impact of those earthquakes. If we take the 1906 earthquake, for instance, repeat that, uh, we can look back at the historical intensities from that earthquake and look at the pager results if that earthquake were to happen today. And now we have a new tool called the two-pager, which we've developed collaboratively with FEMA using HAZDIS, combining pager and HAZDIS to get more granular loss estimates on the county level, census tract level, and summarizing those in a simple form of what we call here the two-pager. The beauty of going back in time with these um, intensity measurements is we can make very good shape maps for past earthquakes as well as good shape maps for modern earthquakes. And these shape maps can be then used to calibrate loss models, which ultimately can be used to calibrate risk models. So we go back in time, we generate shape maps for earthquakes from the past, and we can take those and calibrate those against uh, the shaking the population and the losses for each particular earthquake to derive country-specific fatality rates or loss rates for economic losses that can then be used in the pager system and for other uh, loss modelers for doing calibration, which then, like I said, feeds back to better risk analysis in the long term. So the pager system, as I mentioned, puts out uncertain estimates of fatalities and economic losses. Communicating this uh, uncertainties is really challenging, but we've come up with a, a simple way of portraying that. And that's important because we have a wide variety of users that are trying to digest this information. So any conversation about um, these kinds of products is really important to understand who's using them and for what purposes. And so we spend a lot of time interacting with our users in different uh, products and evolving these products to provide particular formats, particular layers, and particular content that, uh, that these users can easily digest. And therefore, these things now show up very rapidly within the media, uh, including this post-earthquake uh, news reports from Al Jazeera and New York Times, as well as uh, showing up in the media and more generally uh, for earthquakes around the globe. Another important use um, is uh, quite surprising now. To me, is the widespread use of these tools for financial decision making, particularly uh, in addition to what you'd imagine, insurance and, um, and building design, also for response. And so these agencies are making post-earthquake financial decisions, whether they are reinsurance, catastrophe bonds, contingency loans, and other financial payouts based on the products that we're producing. For example, here's an uh, image of the uh, 7, magnitude 7.8 2016 uh, earthquake in Ecuador, and based on the pager exposure and population shaking levels, uh, the Inter-American Development Bank supported the Ecuador credit line, the contingency loan based on the, the earthquake's occurrence uh, within a few days of the earthquake. Now, these real-time tools can also be used, of course, for risk mitigation, and our risk analysis in the USGS has really evolved very, very quickly. It's only really come on board in the last five or so years. This is the USGS risk plan, the science for a risky world, where we look at our hazard evaluations across multi-peril and look at the intersection of society and better plan what kinds of tools, what kind of products, and what kind of information we need to provide and, again, evolve these tools to be more useful uh, in terms of their formats and who gets in and uses these tools. This actually, this science for a, uh, a risky world, which is now called the risk community of practice, evolved from an earlier group that was known as SAFER, 
science for uh, application for risk reduction. And um, that group had put out a number of different scenarios that shake out ArcStorm and more recently ArcStorm 2. And both the ArcStorm um, uh, scenarios actually came to fruition really just a few weeks ago with the incredible rainstorms in Northern California, Central Southern California. But these tools of science for application of risk reduction were the predecessor to our now risk plans that we're doing more widely. So USGS is a has only recently been getting into the risk uh, endeavors, and it evolved from our ability to develop the hazard, underlying hazard, look at the losses from those, and then add the probabilistic component to get to the risk from these particular hazards. And one of the things we're doing now is looking at, uh, and I have a postdoc, Sabine Los, who's looking at these products through an equity lens, trying to understand who's using them and how they may better use these products if we redevelop them in terms of looking through the equity lens at who's uh, using them and who's not using them and trying to better target those products in their formats and their um, and the kind of content that would improve uh, the, e the equity component. And in initial results coming out of those efforts are showing us what we can do in terms of improving our socioeconomic and demographic information, breakdown of structures, and displaced populations that we'll be working on for our, our new evolution of the pager and the two pager system. And with that, I will thank you.